Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCullough. Thanks for joining me. It's October 12th, 2023. It's a Thursday. We got a guest coming up right now. He's been in the industry for nearly four decades. Grant Williams. Uh, he's an author. Uh, he's a host of the Grant Williams podcast. Uh, you've probably heard his name. The guy's been writing for 35 plus years about the market, taking big picture views. We're going to get his view coming up right now of what's going on geopolitically, what's going on with this bond market, and will it continue to get hit or is this an anomaly? We're going to talk about equities, his view of the next 10 years, and of course, his favorite investment, the island question, what he'd be investing in for the next 10 years and going away. You might be interested to hear what he's going to pick. Coming up right now, making money, Grant Williams. Do you own one of America's seven most dangerous stocks? These seven stocks have been on a tear this year, driving about 75% of all the gains the S&P 500 has seen in the first half of 2023 and leaving the other 493 in the dust. But here's what most folks don't know. Owning even one of these stocks could be a dangerous mistake. That's because what's around a corner for the stock market could catch you off guard. It's a distinct pattern that happens roughly every 10 to 12 years. And each time, it opens a rare window in the stock market where investors stand to create or lose huge amounts of wealth. Right now, it's on the verge of happening again. We put everything you need to know, including the names of these seven stocks, in a new report we'd like to send you today for free. Get the facts yourself. Go to sevenstocksreport.com to get your free copy. You can get the full list of the seven most dangerous stocks and prepare for what's coming. Again, that's sevenstocksreport.com for a free copy of our new report. As I mentioned, folks, here he is, Grant Williams. Grant, thanks so much for coming on the show here for the first time. And I, I, we were talking beforehand. It's unfortunate. I've seen you speak a couple of times at the Stansberry Conference. Uh, we never actually met in person, but we probably have passed many times over there. Um, and always uh, such, a, such a great speech and presentation that you give. I mean, it's, you, you bring up stuff, Grant, that I think most people don't think about, which I appreciate <laughs> because it gets my mind churning. Well, that's very kind of you, Matt. I, um, you, know, I, the, you know, the Stansbury guys put on a great conference. I'm, I'm bummed that I won't be able to make it this year, but um, hopefully I'll be back. And I've, uh, you know, as I say, I've always enjoyed talking to that uh, that audience. They're a they're a smart group of people, and um, you know, the questions I get after all those presentations are always, you know, I, I go away thinking, hmm, yeah, okay, I need to think about that too. So it's uh, it works both <laughs> ways. I promise you. It does. It does. Yeah. So thanks for coming. Hopefully, we'll see you again that uh, next year as well. So, so let's just talk big picture, uh, you know, Grant. You know. Actually, you know what? Let's take a step back. If you were to, if you were to step on stage right now, what do you think the big topic is that uh, investors out there should be thinking about? Well, yeah, that, that's such a great way of phrasing the questions because there are so many things that um, that investors will be thinking about, and obviously, mm -hmm. with the uh, appalling events happening in um, Israel and the Gaza Strip this week, we've got something else to think about. Um, but I, you know, for me, the thing that people should be thinking about, uh, it's, it's, it's all about interest rates in the bond market. That's, that's the thing that, that people need to really spend time thinking about because, you know, I'm in the middle of writing a piece about this at the moment. Um, and, you know, I spoke about this a, a while ago, I think in a presentation I did maybe a year or so ago, just talking about how the fact that the interest rate environment has changed. Um, means everything's changed. And so we've been very fortunate to have lived for, you know, four decades essentially with a, a really solid trending interest rate environment. Interest rates were going lower and we've had a few little blow ups. But in the scheme of things, if you look, you go back and zoom out on a big chart, the S&P, you'll barely see 2000. You know, 2008 came and went without a whisper, really. Um, from a market perspective, obviously there's a lot of damage done to, to people's lives and stuff. Um, but from a market perspective, purely, it barely registers. And, you know, once again, COVID, we kind of shook COVID off straight away. Um, but if you take a look at the chart of the 10 year bond, for example, you can look at the 30 year bond if you want, it doesn't matter. If you look at that 40 year trend line from the, the peak in 1981, and you see the, the, the breakout we've had in, in bond yields, it changes everything. And because that cycle has been going on for so long, people have become conditioned to the way that they believe the markets work. Um, and they have worked that way for, for 40 years, which is uh, more than the length of most people's career. So there aren't many people around that remember how things used to work. But if you can go back 
a couple of hundred years and look over the aggregate of how markets work, the last 40 years have been an absolute outlier. And so we've all become conditioned to abnormal market functioning. And what's happening now, which is causing so much panic and so much pain in investors' portfolios, is nothing more than the return to kind of normally functioning markets and a return to a world where central banks aren't omnipotent and can't just move the market around and uh, and do whatever they need to do to, to stay off every little dislocation. So that, to me, is a thing that people need to realize is that the world is very different. Uh, we can't expect for a switch to be flipped and we're back to where we were in that by the dip world where you know central banks have got everything under control and just hold on now and and everything will be fine they'll ride to the rescue and things go back to the way they were and, and i think once you once you understand that and you and you begin to think through seriously with a with a blank sheet of paper okay what does it mean to have interest rates at you know five six seven percent what does it mean to have mortgage rates at nine ten percent which is where we could easily go from here and as soon as you start to do that as I say, with a blank sheet of paper and an open mind, the world looks very, very different indeed. And I, and I would suspect that most people's portfolios are not constructed for the world which we're in now and the world which we're going to stay in for some considerable amount of time. That's, that's a great insight. I like how you brought up the long term, looking back to 1981, because we have been in a, in a clear downtrend uh, as far as uh, interest rates were concerned, and we broke that downtrend. So now that that's broken, Grant, do you think – that we start a new long-term sustainable uptrend in yields, basically bond prices come down for uh, years looking out? Or is this a situation where inflation gets under control, the Fed gets scared again by end of next year and starts cutting rates? Uh, where do you see it going? Well, it's, it's important to understand. It's, it's, very, it's, it's kind of difficult to have long-term rates trending higher. Um, mm -hmm. because ultimately it does damage to a credit-based economy. So you, you tend to get sharp rises higher as a corrective mechanism, and then you'll get what we're into now, I think, which is kind of just higher for longer. It doesn't mean they're going to keep going higher, but they're going to stay elevated. Um, and, and that realization I don't think has dawned, particularly on equity investors yet. You can see it dawning on bond investors you know, by, the, by the hour on, on, the, on your Bloomberg screen, you know. Um, we're seeing absolute chaos in the bond market at the moment and the kind of losses, um, mark-to-market -market losses, that we haven't seen in a generation. Um, so I, I don't think we're going to – rates are going to keep going higher. I don't think we're going to back into a 1980 scenario where rates get to 20%. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but you'd have to say the chance of that happening, given – the background, which the macro, the geopolitical background, which we'll come on to in a second, um, it's not zero. If you'd have asked, I think, anybody in the markets two, three years ago, let's say pre COVID, what are the chances of double digit rates? Everybody would have said zero. There is no chance that we'll have uh, double digit rates. One, because w what are the conditions that would take us there? And two, because they would break everything. And yet, you know, here we are at five, six. The equity market hasn't broken yet. The bond market is in the process of breaking. And, you know, there was a Barclays piece put out this week, and Barclays said very clearly that the only thing that's going to save the bond market now is a collapse in the equity market. You know, we need people panicking out of equities and into the bond market to bring yields down. And if you think about that as a position for us to be in as investors, it's not good. Uh, it's not good at no. all. And so I suspect the shoe that's yet to drop is, is a realization on the part of equity investors that rates are going to stay higher. We're seeing um, uh, an awful lot of companies file for bankruptcy. We are going to come into a period where there are going to be an awful lot of companies that cannot roll their debt over and, and will, again, be forced to file. So that shoe is yet to drop. And, and I think everybody's kind of hoping that, you know, inflation moderates, the Fed talk dovishly, and maybe we can stick this landing and the equity markets don't need to panic. They can tread water while everything kind of calms down. I just don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, I, I talked about it on Tuesday. You know, everybody gets on the Fed. Everybody wants to hate the Fed for whatever reason. You know, they're too aggressive. They're not aggressive enough. People love to hate the Fed. And I, I've always been uh, in, the, in the side of, you know, let the Fed do their work. But then at that point, let, the, let these interest rate hikes make their way into the economy. And I always say, you know, if, if interest rates go up 50 basis points, the Fed last year raising 50 basis points, as an entrepreneur with different companies, I don't change what I do. However, if I'm going to borrow money a few months later, it is going to change my decision. You multiply that by, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of small businesses in just the United States. That's what we're seeing right now, I think. I think all those interest rates 
hikes are starting to play out now. So I do agree with you. You see it in, this, in a bankruptcy numbers for small companies, especially. Um, so as this plays out, is there a scenario, though, where the Fed does wipe their hands and say, OK, they panic on the other side and truly just start cutting rates dramatically? And would that be a prop to the equity market or is that just short term? Well, look, it, it's it's never say never, right? I, I, yeah. I think they're serious. Um, and I think the reason so many people have been caught off guard, and it's interesting the distinction you made there, you know, when you talked about being a business owner. And I think that's one of the big changes over this over this period of time, this last kind of three or four decades we're talking about, is that uh, people used to think of themselves as owners of a stock, as owners of a company, having an interest in a company. And that's just not the way it is anymore. People people don't invest, right? They 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 buy and sell stocks. And most of the time they're looking – to trade they may not think of it in those terms but generally when things go up people are looking to flip them and move on to the next thing and people are always looking for what's the next hot sector and that's why we're seeing all this massive crowding into the seven big stocks in 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 the tech world that, that have sucked up so much capital but as a business owner or as as an investor who wants to own a business the interest rate environment you're talking about changes everything and so people are going to be much more careful in in borrowing they're not going to be able to borrow for kind of crazy projects that they funded because it was free to do so and we'll roll the dice if it doesn't work out it doesn't really cost us anything so you're going to see a lot more sensible use of capital but for the fed to to panic as you say look we we i'm sure we'll get some kind of uh severe dislocation in the equity markets you can just feel it coming um the question is going to be how quickly now do they jump in and and reverse course because if the bond market's anything to go by and the bond market is obviously much bigger and can cause much more pain than the equity markets they've shown an enormous amount of 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 strength of character let's call it being generous in the face of that and they've pushed on they've they've continued to hammer home this message to investors that you know we need to keep rates here and of course the big difference this time around from 2000, 2001, the recession we had there, 2008, and all the little blips in between, including COVID, um, pre-COVID, is that they never had inflation on the other side keeping them honest. They were always able to do this. They were able to cut rates down to zero and beyond and keep them there because inflation, as people understand it, never really raised its head and never really became obvious. Um, And that's changed. And so just because the CPI moderates um and there are certainly signs if you look at the predictions for the cpi this week that that people are worried that inflation is going to start ticking up again particularly with uh, the spike in energy prices we've seen um it's just not going up quite as fast but it's at the point where it's impacting real people's lives and the cost of living has become uppermost in people's minds and that that feeds through into inflation expectations it feeds through into the way people manage their household budgets um and it and it changes the way the economy functions it changes consumer spending which is obviously a massive part of of the u.s economy so the fed can't just cut rates um with abandon this time around because if they do that and inflation rears up again which all the all the kind of kindling is is still sitting there in the economy it's all there if they cut rates again and inflation goes high, particularly energy inflation and house price and rent inflation and food inflation, which are the three most vulnerable places, going into an election in November next year, that's a world of hurt. And so for the first time, we're seeing the constraints placed upon the Fed. You know, my, my friend um, Marco Papich at Clocktail always talks about this idea of constraints and preferences and it's such a wonderful framework to think about things through like we all have our preferences there's all kinds of things that we wish would happen we want to happen we want to set ourselves up for but we all have constraints and for the first time central banks have very clear constraints as do politicians about what they want to do because if they if they take the path they've wanted to which is easing um you know negative interest rates all those things we've seen the constraints against that now are inflation and that is a political constraint because that's why governments get voted out of power is because of inflation. So it, it's a very, very different world, Matt, and and people need to understand that and at least take the time to think through what does this mean? What does this new world mean potentially for me? Because it's not as easy as it was by the dip, by the dip, by the dip. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Marco. He's going to be on a show next week. Uh, what, you Marco's know, great. Both Absolutely of you fantastic. kind of cut from the same cloth, I feel like, this great macro view uh, of what's going on. Oh, look, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy anytime I get mentioned the same breath as Marco Pappas. He's, uh, <laughs> he's an absolute, uh, absolute superstar. I love the yeah. guy, and he's just such a great thinker. So from an investor standpoint, Grant, you know, a, lot, a lot of listeners obviously have their exposure to equities, but I'd like to talk a bit more about fixed income and bonds right here. If we're going to have rates higher for longer – does that then put investing in bonds uh, kind of where it's been for the last couple of years? I looked at the rolling 5, 10, 20 year return of uh, the, the U.S. aggregate bond market. All of them are in a lower one percentile. I mean, yeah. I think 20 year was at zero, if I'm not mistaken. So I look at that as a contrarian and think to myself, boy, there's got to be some opportunity here in fixed income. Am, am I crazy? Look, there are there there will definitely be opportunities in fixed income. You know, if you look at if you take a look, the easiest proxy look at TLT, right? Which is yeah. which is everybody's proxy for 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 diving in from on an ETF to get into the, the treasury market. It's wiped out, I think, sixteen years of gains, right, in the last yeah. year or so. Uh, if you look at the uh, the current thirty year bond issued in twenty twenty, a one and a quarter percent coupon U.S. thirty year treasury expi- uh, matures in twenty fifty. Uh, you've lost um, – it's a 30-year bond, and as my friend Chris Bloomstrand pointed out on Twitter the other day, you've lost 46 years of coupon payments on a 30-year bond, right? It's it's trading uh, 45% of its face value. So these are very material losses, and, and it's a wake-up call to people who believe you can't lose money in bonds. Now, look, you can hold that to maturity. It's very unlikely you won't get your principal back, but you've got to hold this thing for 27 years, to get your money back now, right? So it's a very different world. So when it comes to investing in fixed income, um, guess what? Credit quality matters again, right? Buying these bonds, buying junk bonds at stupid yields that made no sense whatsoever. You know, the uh, HGY uh, ETF and JNK ETF, these things made no sense at the time. We always knew it was a matter of time before reality um, reinforced that. And here we are. But you know, good corporate bonds of good credits, there'll be some tremendous opportunities simply because rates are this high and you're going to get companies that with really good credit ratings and phenomenal businesses that are forced to offer really good uh, coupons in order to attract capital. And that's, that is a great opportunity. No two ways about it, but it's not as simple anymore as buying the junk bond ETF and buying the treasury ETF because we, as we've seen, um, you know, you can you can wipe out an awful lot of 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 capital, and and look, the the, the thirty year treasury um, has wiped out a total return on the US uh, thirty year treasury has wiped out again, wiped out a decades worth of gains. So, um, you know, you you just can't help whenever you talk about this, you are realizing just how different the world is, and it's it's different to what we've known, but it's. It's very familiar to anyone that's kind of read history and has understood how markets fundamentally are supposed to work. And, you know, interest rates, the price of credit and the and the quality of credit are two of the bedrocks of the entire financial system. They've just been ignored for a, a you know, decade or two. You know, I saw a great post on Twitter. It showed pullbacks, uh, 2008, the, the, the blip in 2020 for COVID, 2000 uh, for the U.S. stock market. And then it overlaid the pullback, the current pullback in the Treasury market. And it's, it's amazing. It basically said, imagine if this pullback or this massive sell-off was stocks. People would be going absolutely yeah. bananas right now. Yet that that sell-off's greater than we've had it, that we had in equities uh, overall uh, in, those, in those times I mentioned. But we don't have many people talking about this. So it's a great the mass point, media's you know, not. It, it's, it's a great point. And uh, you know, there was a report this week, Bank of America went back and somehow found bond market data going back to, I think it was 1787 in the US. And they looked at the various uh, bond bear markets. And, and, and this one that we're in now is twice, I, th- I think it was twice as dramatic as the second closest one going back to the founding of America. So that's, that puts it in perspective just how much chaos is going on. You know, in 1994, uh, this is what I've been writing about um, the last couple of days, we had what was what became known as the Great Bond Massacre, um, and the the setup was very very similar. You know, we'd had inflation, we'd had a period of rising interest rates, the interest rates had stayed up longer than people thought, and there was a, a, a panic in the bond market. And 
as I say, it became known as the Great Bond Massacre. It spread from the US to Canada. It went to um, the UK. It went to Finland. It went to France. There was chaos. It was half as bad the drawdown as what we're seeing now. Um, and what we haven't seen yet is the kind of other side. We haven't seen the political fallout, although the you know, the Fitch downgrade a couple of months ago, I, I suspect, is is the first kind of sign of that. We haven't seen uh, governments being forced out, but I suspect that will happen in the not too distant future. Um, this is a very serious event that's going on now. And, and to your point, just because it's not getting talked about so much, you know, don't forget – there are an awful lot of journalists who haven't seen this before, right? They're also, sure. this has been their career as well. So then they're covering things that, that they've been conditioned to think, well, it is a blip. The bond market's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a real dearth of, of experience and there's a dearth of information coming to a group of investors who have grown up and learned their, their craft in a, an environment that, that, doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's a moment in time. And the sooner people realize that, I think the safer they're going to be. Yeah. So I've been doing this 25 years and uh, this is different for me. And and I had to take a step back uh, about a year or two ago uh, and look myself in the mirror and say, you know, what I'm doing, I'm going to keep doing my big long-term investing, but I have to change things a little bit. I need to tweak it because things are different. It's not free money like it has been for two decades. You know, things, things are a bit different. I need to look at that. Um, I was never much of a bond investor. I see some opportunity in bonds coming up. So I, I need to, to look outside the box. And I think you're right. I, I sit on a board for, for an international school and I met with their advisor from Schwab the other day and I'm speaking to this woman, nothing against Schwab, but the lack of knowledge when we were talking about fixed income blew my mind, Grant. And this is somebody who manages lots and lots of money. And uh, if, if they're not seeing it, I can't see the individual investor really grasping what this means for their long-term portfolio. Um, so let's just take it a, a one more level, uh, Grant, to kind of the big macro, what's going on in the world. You know, obviously we have uh, what's going on in Israel right now. We've had what's been going on in Ukraine for a while. Uh, we have protests all over. You name the country, we have it. Um, does this affect your outlook as well? Look, it has to. You, 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 have, to, you have to think about geopolitics now. There, there have been periods um, during the period that we're talking about where you've you've been okay to kind of discount geopolitical uncertainty because we've lived in a pretty stable world. You know, my fear is that what we're seeing now is not just coincidence. It's not just, Oh, that we just happen to, you know, this is just real bad luck that we happen to have a few things going on at the same time, you know, in Ukraine and in the middle East and potentially China and Taiwan. Um, you know, when I look at that and when I look at, um, the work of Halford McKinder back in the 1900s, when I look at the work of Neil Howe and Bill Strauss with the fourth turning, when you look at these big pictures, you look at some of the bigger cycles, look at Kondratiev waves, look at war cycles, they all kind of converge on the period we're in now as a time of enormous uncertainty. And when you when you look at the cyclical forces at play, and, and look, there are some people that don't believe in cycles, and that's that's absolutely fine. I, I do very much so, and, and I've I, I rely on them to try and help me build a framework that that makes sense of everything. But if if this is a fourth turning that we're in now, um, and for anyone that hasn't read that book, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Nor Neil's follow up, which is just published. The fourth turning is here. Um, if this is a fourth turning, then the changes that we're going to see are not just going to be in the bond market; they're going to be in the, the, the entire rules-based global order that we've come to know and, and that's provided a safety blanket for, for many, many years. And so the, the, the actions of China and Russia um, being held up in isolation versus uh, a shift towards countries in that part of the world trying to reassert they, what they feel is their place in the global pecking order at a time when the US, for all its military might, is, if not weak, then certainly weaker than it has been in many, many decades. And so you are going to see, I think, an awful lot of opportunism uh, by the likes of Hamas or Hezbollah or the Syrian regime or North Korea. And we've kind of seen that bubbling away for a few years now. Um, America is perceived as weaker than it has been. And 
not just from a geopolitical standpoint, you know, when, when, when Donald Trump decided he wanted to become a little bit more isolationist and Biden pulled out of Afghanistan, there were very clear signals sent there that the US is, is withdrawing. Um, so they, they've, they've kind of ceded a lot of geopolitical ground but they're also, they're economically weak. You know, the debts, the deficits, which is all at the root of what's happening in the bond market. People are starting to wake up to the fact that America, like most other countries, is, is if not bankrupt, um, then certainly it looks remarkably like it. <laughs> They've depleted the strategic petroleum reserve. They are hostage to uh, the oil price going higher because that also feeds very quickly through to inflation. So it's not just the fact that, okay, Russia, Ukraine is something that happened in isolation. The events in Israel is just something that happened in isolation. These are, these are, this is, this timing is deliberate to, to try and see what America's resolve is like. Can they fight a war on two fronts? Does the public have either the stomach for another war or are they more worried about domestic issues and all the aid money that we want to spend in the Ukraine that could be better spent at home? And you're seeing this. You're seeing this in, in some of the political discourse. You're seeing it in some of the response from the public. You're seeing it in Joe Biden trying to get this one and done Ukraine aid bill through that will keep him going till the next election in the hundred plus billions of dollars. And the American public are balking at it. So no matter what you think, and, and America is still the strongest country on earth, but relative to how it's been in the past, it is weaker. And that is something that people are going to test. And, and I and I, I feel very strongly that we are at the beginning of something rather than at the end of it in terms of that that strength being tested. And, it, and it, it troubles me a great deal, I have to say. Yeah, I mean, I can't agree with you more. Every word you said, um, you said it more eloquently than I could ever say that. But, um, you know, I, I see it here, though. I mean, I spent half my time in Nicaragua. So and I spent half my time here in the States. So I go back and forth. But um, when I'm here, uh, even though Nicaragua is the second poorest nation in all of Latin America, um, I almost feel better there. I'll be honest with you. It, it's very depressing. It just, uh, the, the way people are right now, everything's so damn negative. And, um, you know, I think the timing, you're right. I think this timing was so planned out. We're a year before an election. We have all this stuff going on. There's pressure already on the administration. I mean, if you couldn't put more pressure on with this, I mean, I, this is perfect for, for what they're trying to achieve here to, to more uprising and, and more lack of um, support of our government. I mean, you're seeing it more and more every second of the day um, and, and, more, and tearing us apart more, too, as a country. You yep. probably see it, too. You know, you're just separating. I hate to use left and right, but you're separating the left and the right more and more. Even if politics are involved, you're getting separated more and more. So. What does that mean for the U.S. dollar, Grant? Does that mean that the U.S. dollar will be closer to losing uh, kind of the crown? Well, look, again, it's a great question, and, and it's a, another really important thing for people to think through. And, you know, I, I, ironically, the dollar has been getting obviously a lot stronger through all this, which which actually makes sense. Um, you know, people are, are looking at it as a safe haven currency. They're looking at the, the finances of all these other currencies and realizing that they're in just as bad state. Now, ultimately, you know, I think my friend Brent Johnson has this right. The dollar will also fall, but it'll be the last currency standing. But there's this, there's a big debate going on about the dollar's role as reserve currency. And, and, and this is the thing um, that again, feeds back into that very deliberate challenging of, of us hegemony that's, that's happening in various places all around the world. And the currency is definitely going to be one of those. You know, we've had a lot of talk about the BRICS um, and, and a challenge to, to the dollar. And it's generally, again, like everything else in our lives around us these days, there are two very distinct camps. On the one hand, you've got the camp that says the dollar will be the global reserve currency forever. You're wasting your time. Don't even think about it. It's never going to change. And you've got the other group which say, well, it's it's going to be done tomorrow. You know, it's, it's finished. The dollar's finished. It's over. And of course, neither is true. Um, but the distinction I think is really important to make. And, and, and I give credit to to Luke Grumman for this, you know, he's, he's written a lot about this and he's, I think he's absolutely right. Is we have, we have two components to the dollar. We have the dollar as a reserve currency and we have the dollar as a reserve asset. And it's really important to understand the difference between the two, you know, on the currency side, the dollar facilitates so much trade. It's very, very unlikely whilst it might decline and dwindle a little bit here and there. It's very unlikely that as a global reserve currency, there's anything that will challenge the US dollar uh, in the short term and even in the medium term. You know, if, if the BRICs do come up with a currency, it's difficult to see how that will work 
seamlessly and it's difficult to see how it will be adopted um you know hungrily by the rest of the world i think that's a bit of a stretch unless of course it is has some kind of gold backing but even then you know we have to understand what that gold backing means it's quite possible to be gold backed at the central bank level and not gold backed at the at the you know individual level in which case it's no good to anybody still so there's a lot of talk about that and we just don't know which way it's going to go what we do know is is two things one is that the BRICS, uh, and, and i'm not confining um this group to brazil russia india china south africa i'm talking about the BRICS as a as a kind of the global south let's call them i think that's the, the trendy word for them now this is a group of countries who justifiably feel that the dollar ha- gives the u.s way too much control over them and and imposes restrictions upon them that they 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 don't have any need to to suffer they are motivated to find alternatives to the dollar and the actions of the treasury when they froze russian central bank assets back uh, in kind of march of 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 21 when russia went into ukraine um that was a massive wake-up call for every single central bank on the planet the fact that russian central bank assets which are a national security issue could be at the whim of the u.s treasury was a wake-up call and that move forces every central bank on the planet to have a plan for how to deal with this. And and that feeds through to them wanting to own less dollars as a reserve asset. Um, And so when you accumulate your surpluses, a lot of people have accumulated their dollar surpluses. And because of the way the energy markets are structured and oil is essentially exclusively uh, settled in US dollars, it meant every, uh, every energy importing nation on the planet had to hold dollars to be able to pay for its most critical import. And every export uh, dollar exporting, uh, sorry, energy exporting country on the planet had massive dollar surpluses, which they recycled into treasuries as a, as a dollar reserve asset. And of course, that was where Russia's Achilles heel came because they held uh, US dollars um, in, in treasuries and they held gold and they held all these kind of things in foreign central banks. They were prone to US sanctions. So this is where the problems begin, is all the countries that that have built up dollar reserves are not going to want to recycle as many of them into treasuries. They're going to want to diversify. They're going to want to hold other assets, which is why we've seen an awful lot of um, global South central banks buying gold in the last year. They bought more gold last year than they have since 1957, I think it was, since records began. And there's a reason for that. It's not to do with gold. It's to do with having their reserves in an asset that is nobody's liability, that can't you know, be, be blocked by um, a malignant actor, can't be blocked by a central bank that decides that you're on the wrong side of a particular argument anymore. And so that is a real change that's happening. Um, and of course, having the central banks of the world who were the biggest buyers of US debt suddenly start to go a little bit cooler on it and look for alternatives at the same time that we have the deficits we have in the US um, and we have uh, the debt levels we have in the US is one of the big fuels to what's happening in the bond markets now. So all of this is coming together at a, at a very um, unfortunate time and in a very unfortunate way. But as crazy as the action in the bond market seems, if you sit back and look at all the different components to it, it actually it, it makes all the sense in the world. The picture is actually very, very clear. And the incentives of everybody involved are, are plain for all to see. It seems like that trend's not ending anytime soon either. I, I feel like you know the underlying components of that are going to continue to move in that direction. Yeah, I, I think yeah. you're right. I think I think we are, we are now trending, and I think that yeah. you know that you take a look at that ten year um, JG ten uh, year Treasury yield chart that we talked about earlier, and you see the breakout we've had. You can yeah. see a forty year trend, and you can see a very 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 clear and significant break of that, and that I suspect means we will be trending in the other direction for a while. It won't be as steep. And it will it will end and, and rates will come down, but not until they've killed inflation, not until the kind of global risk premium, which is elevating by the day, is kind of yeah. muted a little bit more. You know, we, we are in a period of, if not strongly rising, then higher interest rates. And that, as we said at the top of the show, uh, changes everything. Yeah. So before I let you go, Grant, I ask uh, all my guests, uh, I call it the island question. If I were to send you, your family, your friends to a beautiful island, uh, not the island you're on right now. Maybe you want to stay there, but maybe a, a different island. For 10 years, what is the one asset class, the one investment that you feel real comfortable putting your money into today for a long 10-year-plus investment? 
Oh, look, um, I, I'm going to have – it's very boring, but I'm going to have to go yeah. with gold. Go on, P- okay. Purely because uh, I think the next 10 years are going to be very volatile. They are going to be populated by crises. They're going to be populated by inflation. Um, and they're going to be populated by geopolitical discord. And gold does well in all of those environments. And so, you know, I, I think if if you decide to be long bonds, for example, you've got to get the right bonds. If you want to be yeah. in the equity market for those 10 years, you've got to pick the equities carefully because I don't think it's a rising tide lifting all boats. Same with real estate, same with commercial real estate, all these things you've got to be clever and, and get a little bit lucky. For me, gold is something that I... I, I feel confident that at very worst it will do okay, and and when I come back after those ten years, my purchasing power is going to be the same, and I can I can you know take a look at uh, the world around me and, and decide what to do with that capital. I agree with you one hundred percent. With uh, you talked about commercial real estate, equities, bonds, it's not going to make the last twenty years where again rising tide lifts all ships. You are going to have to actually it's going to make us do more work. I mean, we're going to we're going to see who's good and who's yeah. not. Yeah, you know, in our business, I think it really. Look, this is not an easy control. game. It's not an yeah. easy game. Um, and people have forgotten that because if you look at the charts, it looks easy. And if you mm-hmm. look at the way the Federal Reserve have have soothed, smoothed over any periods of volatility, it kind of has been easy. But that's not the long term status of of investing. It just isn't. And so you know, people are going to get a wake up call, I think. And, and it's it's not going to be pretty for a lot of them. But uh, ultimately, uh, it it will give people who do the work that you talked about, yeah. who take the time to understand the companies they want to own and the, where they want to be in the cap table of those companies, it, it, it should help them get rewarded for, for putting that work in. Yeah, go back to, like you said before, think you're an owner of that company. You're an owner of that company. Right. You're not buying a ticker symbol and selling a ticker symbol. You actually own a very small piece of that company. And that's what exactly you're investing. Right. If you think that company's be bigger 10 years from now, it's probably a pretty good investment. Yeah. Um, it's simple. But not easy, Grant. Not easy at all. That's it. Simple but not <laughs> but, easy. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, it was a pleasure. As I said, you're one, one of our favorite speakers at the Stansbury Conference. I'm uh, going to miss you this year, but hopefully we'll get you back on stage next year again. Um, but uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for all your insight. I'd love to catch up in a few months, see where we're standing, and take it from there. Yep. Well, I hope to see you next year as well, man. Enjoy the conference. Give my regards to everybody, and, uh, and thanks for having me on the show. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.